Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And just a reminder, or you may be new to the, sh new to the show, our home base is wedontdie.com. From there, you can find all past episodes, you can find classes, medium classes, demonstrations, and every Sunday at two o'clock New York time, we offer what's called our Sunday gathering. It's free. It's a non-denominational empowering service. And there's a medium demonstration within each and every one. Also at the very bottom of the page at we don't die.com. If you want to enter your email address and name, it says you get the first few chapters of my book. The truth is it's the entire book because I don't want anything to stop you from having the information. Chapter 10 is all about grief. And sorry to say, grief is usually what gets people listening to the show and having evidence that their loved ones live on. So again, that's at the bottom of the page at wedontdie.com. Now, let me tell you about our guest. Can you believe it? She is a Shark Tank winning self-taught carpenter and furniture designer who built an internationally known kids furniture company out of her garage. Her name is Kirsten Hathcock. And what most people don't know is that she calls herself just an ordinary science-minded mom, but she's known some very difficult times and she was thrown into an extraordinary spiritual set of circumstances, which she'll share with us today. This intuitive awakening led to partnerships with detectives and a traditional publishing deal for her memoir, the beautiful book called Little Voices. You can find out more about her at KirstenHathcock.com. Kirsten, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Oh, thank you, Sandra. I'm so happy to be here. I'm thrilled to have you. And when we set this up, I knew just who you were and I had to go back through Shark Tank and I'm like, I saw that episode. <laughs> you did? Oh my gosh. I love that. I did. Mom and I watch it all the time. So, wow. Tell us about you. Tell us a little bit about your background and sure. maybe if you could say a couple of things about getting on Shark Tank. And then of yeah. course, we've got an extraordinary journey that you've been on that's led to this yes. day so yes i will i will share it all um and, and honestly i used to think that being on shark tank was going to be the most interesting thing about my life <laughs> and it turns out it's not <laughs> so, but i love that experience and i can share a little bit about it so um to kind of back up, I grew up in Ohio. My parents were teachers. My dad was a football coach and uh, moved out to California, married two children, um, ended up working in corporate America, mostly for TV and in the TV industry. So I worked for A&E and the History Channel. And then once our youngest daughter was, I think she was around one, I didn't want to go back to work full time. I wanted to still make that income, but try and do something from home. So um, I had this, you know, it, it, now I know it's intuition. Then I thought, well, this is crazy. Why am I thinking I can build furniture and I have no experience <laughs> with this? Um, and I thought, well, I'll give it a try. My dad used to build furniture in our house, so I'll try it. So I built furniture, specifically kid stuff. And um, I, I like the mid-century modern style. So I started building that type of toy box back in 2007. And at that point, uh, you know, I just thought, gosh, well, this is gonna help pay the bills. Like I can pay the gas bill with this, right? And it exploded in a way that I never thought would happen. So all of a sudden I'm starting to get orders from New York, from celebrities, from England, from all over the place. And so within four years, it was at the point where I needed manufacturing help which is what led me to Shark Tank. Because at that point I thought, I can't, there's no way I can do anything, you know, about this, just doing all this myself in the garage. I'm so overwhelmed. So, um, so I applied to Shark Tank. That was how I got there, at least. <laughs> so, um, so once I got on Shark Tank, I ended up getting two offers and um, there's a whole journey and a whole section of that in my book where I talk about all of that. But, you know, it was actually one of the best things I've ever done because it, it taught me to trust my intuition more so than I'd ever done. And I was 34, I believe at the time when all that happened. Um, so, you know, I had lived a good chunk of life without really knowing a what intuition was, um, you know, how to trust it. I knew nothing. 
So, um, you know, I get into the Shark Tank years and I'm like, this is great. I did it. I've, I've expanded. I'm partnering internationally. I've got a manufacturer. Um, and I thought, okay, well, this is awesome. Pinnacle of everything. And then, of course, I shouldn't have thought that because then everything goes downhill from there, uh, where I end up having an awakening where I sort of figure out that I was abused as a child. Um, and all of that came through intuition. And that was what was so interesting about it. I, out of the blue, started hearing and seeing children who were in spirit. And many of them, I noticed a pattern, had been abused sexually in their lifetime or had been killed by predators. Slow down a bit. Let's go back. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Just getting my head around it. First of all, what was, tell us a little bit more of the experience that that happened to you and how does one know the children that are coming through are on the other side? Like, so how, maybe just talk a little bit more about that world that led you to believe, you know, or to not believe, but to know that this is what's happening. Absolutely. So I know it's, um, you know, it's a story that is unbelievable. And I didn't believe it myself, to be honest with you. My first reaction, you know, I'm in the garage and building furniture. Um, I'm hearing mom or I would see a figure walk across the garage and I would think like a small figure, like what is that my, you know, where are my kids? Oh, wait, they're at school. Okay, what am I seeing? So as that stuff started to ramp up, I started to to think like, this is the polyurethane that I've been breathing for four years. (laughs) This is crazy. Um, I'm very grounded person from Ohio who always trusted all the science data and empirical research. So none of it made sense, similar to your journey. You know, it just, it, it wasn't something that I was prepared for. Um, and I really did think I was going crazy. And, you know, the, the only way that I was able to actually start to believe that there was something not mentally wrong with me is that I started to reach out to different families and different folks, you know, in relationship to who was coming in to talk to me. Um, and thankfully, you know, the, the other side started kind of small, I guess I would say with me. <laughs> I was reading Facebook one night and I remember seeing a message about two, um, I would say kids, they're not kids, they were parents at the time, but I went to school with them and they were a couple years older. I didn't know them very well. And I ended up um, reading about the the loss of their son who had passed away. First of all, I didn't even know they had a son. You know, that's how not close we were. So I am reading this Facebook post and all of a sudden I can feel him next to me. And I had been finally kind of coming to grips with this, you know, and understanding that this was real, talking to a few people that were kind of woo woo, quote unquote, in my mind. So, you know, that was that was at least the basis or the foundation for me before I got this message from Nate. And I talk about Nate in the book quite a bit. Um, He is a force. He is such a force. And I remember thinking, okay, if this is real, then I'll just write down what he's saying because he was asking me to reach out to his parents. Did you, could you see him or would just- I could see him, him. yes. I could see him, him. I could feel him, I could hear him. And it was really strange because you know how Claire's kind of come in typically one at a time. And that's how it started for me. I would smell things, like I would smell smoke. um, And I would think, well, nobody's smoking. Why am I smelling smoke? You know, not recognizing it was my grandfather. So the Claire's all came in, but they came in so quickly that by the time Nate got to me, which was a couple of months in, it was all at once. Yeah, it was, it was nuts. So yeah. he, was, um, he was telling me that I needed to share information with his family. And I said, okay, I'll write it down. And then after that, I kept looking around, like, where did he go? And I thought, all right, well, I'm just gonna put it away for a minute. Because first of all, I don't wanna reach out to grieving parents. I don't wanna hurt them. I was a parent myself like i don't want to hurt them i don't want to be the crazy woman from defiance ohio i don't want this to reflect badly on my parents who still lived in defiance ohio and so i put it away and i went back out into the garage a couple days later and i was working on like the umpteenth toy box that i had built uh, about to ship it out and i had this overwhelming calm and i kind of it was almost like i didn't hear it but i felt like it's time it's time. It's okay. And so I had that moment of, okay, well, I'll try. 
So I reached out to them on Messenger in Facebook and said, I don't know if you remember me. My dad was a football coach. They still live in town. They're normal people. You know, <laughs> they're sane. I promise I'm sane, but I, I, I feel like I, I've communicated with your son on the other side and, um, and he really wants me to pass these messages. I was very grateful because his mom was already believing that he was on the other side. She was already recognizing signs. Um, his dad was not at that point. So he was very skeptical and, um, right. So I ended up passing those, that message. And I even went over to their house when I went home to visit my family. Um, to this day, this, that's been 12 years ago, I think. Was his Um, name Nate? Nate. Uh Yeah. Uh Nate. So I still pass messages to them, to Denise and John, and um, they came to my book launch and they've just been like amazing friends because I, the way I look at it, they helped me and he helped me as much as I helped them. Because Did the father? Had, yes, he came around. You. Yeah. I'm yeah. just so he excited did. to talk to you and hear this story. So yes. the father came around. It was a yes. certain amount of evidence. Mm-hmm. There was. So when I went to sit with them, I don't remember, you know how it is, right? When you channel, I don't remember what I told them. There were snippets of things I remember, but not much. But I sat with them. I sat with their son, their youngest son, who is their only living son now. And, uh, and I remember sharing messages for about an hour and I did that privately. Well, everything came to be whatever it was that I shared came to be. And so at that point, you know, he said, thank you. This is such a gift. I had, I didn't know they were struggling. You know, I didn't know what they were dealing with at the time. Um, but it really changed their lives. It kind of brought them all back together again as a family. Um, and yeah, it was just, it's incredible. I mean, Right then and there, I was like, okay, I'm sold. I, I can do this. <laughs> it's scary, but I can do this because it gave them such hope. Right. That's the whole point of all of it. So then what happened? More so, kids started coming in? More kids. Yes. More kids started coming in. Kids that um, I had some sort of connection to. Uh, there was a child that came in who was related to a dear friend of mine from childhood. And I would go stay at their house and hang out with them and their kids. And, you know, we were family, really close family friends. And uh, I remember when I would go to her house, my toes would be pulled on at night when I was sleeping. The room was really cold. There was just all this stuff happening all around the same time. And thankfully, she didn't think I was nuts, which, you know, a lot of people in my circle were saying this is crazy because no one in my circle was into any of this. Uh, But she didn't. And, you know, long story short, and this is one of the stories in the book that I can't talk about as much because of, you know, for safety reasons and whatnot. But um, there was a little girl who had been abducted and and murdered by a pedophile ring that was trying to get my attention. And there was a connection, you know, in that area. And that's how she found me. So, you know, that freaked me out because now I'm thinking, well, what do I do? Like, what do I do? Am I really supposed to reach out? reached out to the mom of the child who, and this was a cold case. uh, And the mom basically said, thank you. You know, what you're telling me uh, is what happened, uh, even though the public reports say otherwise. So she knew that I was really getting the information from the other side. Um, And then I was able to reach out to other detectives because as we know, it's a ring, you know, and these rings are pretty prevalent. Uh, unfortunately, internationally, and they're intertwined. And so I started to just form relationships with different cops around the country. And my first, the first thing I would say is, hi, I'm Kirsten. I'm a CEO of a furniture company. (laughs) Um, You know, I would try and make it as as clear as possible that, you know, I wasn't um, somebody who was trying to do anything but share information that could be helpful. So, yeah. And they, I would think they'd be open. I've heard lots of great stories. I'm sure just in any field, people aren't. But sometimes in these cases, they're out of clues. Right. And to be able to get one, it's like, let's hear what you have to say, lady. Yeah, exactly. You know, and that's what ended up happening with um, one of my closest partnerships. His name's Mark Pucci. He wrote the foreword for my book. He is a retired NYPD detective. 
And he and I actually just co-founded a nonprofit uh, two years ago called the, called the National Institute for Law and Justice. And we help families whose uh, loved ones have been murdered or are missing. Um, and we're doing a ton of work right now on indigenous nations and on indigenous lands because of you know the need there. Uh, but with him, he said he had worked with other psychics before. And so, you know, he was already, first of all, okay with it, but also very intuitive himself. So I was lucky in that he didn't think initially, you know, let's check this woman out, let's see who she is. But he also didn't give anything away. Um, so one of one of the that partnership specifically didn't even come through that case that I just told you about. It came through another case. It was organized crime murder that happened in New York, and I happened to be connected to someone related to the person who had gone missing to the man. And uh, Mark had agreed as a private detective who was retired that he was going to also volunteer on this case from a different you know angle and uh, found out that I was willing to also work on it. So we connected over the phone. Um, I shared information I was getting from the man on the other side because I knew, I knew he was deceased. And, um, and he said, okay, we'll see what else you can get and then let's meet back up again. And I happened to have been in New York, this was 2014. Uh, and so we met up at a diner and I took my little folder and he had his folder and we sat down and they matched. And it was information that I couldn't have known only from, you know, the man in spirit. Uh, and it matched everything that he had been investigating boots on the ground. So it was at that point, I think that our partnership was solidified. Uh, and then I just continued to help him on cases he was working on as well, you know, until we founded the nonprofit together. How long has this been going on since your first visit in the garage? Right. Thank oh, you. Now. That's a great question. So I just turned 50. Woohoo. Happy just birthday. These readers on. <laughs> I need them oh, too. <laughs> oh, man. I tell you. So I'm 50. I started, actually, I think it was around the age of 36. And I said 34 earlier, but it was 36 when all of this started to happen. And for anyone who's listening that is into numerology, it was on my birthday, which was 9909, and I was turning 36. So it's a lot of nines. <laughs> and I've come to learn that that means something, uh, you know, the, the signs and the numbers and, and all that. So I, you know, that was, it was a moment of me saying, like, I don't understand what's happening. Um, I actually went to a medium. It was the first time ever. And I went to her and said, something's off. I don't feel right. Um, I actually felt more depressed, like I felt like there was sort of a hole in me. And I called it in the book, I called it the gray. I just had this weird filter over top of me. And this was actually prior to me starting to hear and see things. So I, I see this woman and she's basically saying, you're going to help millions of people, children, your life is all about children. And I thought, well, yeah, it is. I've got two kids. I have a children's furniture company. <laughs> it is. I mean, I, I work a lot with kids, uh, but I didn't believe it. I didn't believe it. So at that point, a couple months later, I start hearing, seeing, and then all the rest of it came into my world. My goodness. Is it only children? It sounds like there's some adults mixed in here. Adults mixed in too. Yeah, but, you know, primarily children. And I think, uh, you know, some of that is because I guess that's what I chose to do in this lifetime was to help these kids. Some of it had to do with the fact that I hadn't recognized what had happened in my own life yet. So, you know, I kept asking myself, like I was channeling for three years at one point or two years, I think. And I said, like, I don't get, I, I love that they come to me. Maybe it's because I'm like the goofy mom or, you know, I don't know, but I, I'm glad they're coming and I'm glad I can help, I just don't know why. And that was when I started to connect the dots of all of the sexual abuse I started seeing. So it wasn't until I was 40, four years later, that I started having visions of myself as a young child being abused by my uncle. Yeah. And, you know, at first I thought, well, that I don't know what that is because it was snippets. Um, but had I not believed in my own intuition, in the power of my own visions, and when spirit comes in and shares information, I wouldn't have believed it ever. Like, I would have just dismissed all of that. And so eventually they basically came in, you know, you're helping us, but we came in to help you in a big way. And that was 
that was just the start of things, the revelation, like you would think the book would end there, <laughs> like ta-da, and they told her she was abused as a kid, and then, you know, she lived happily ever after, um, but they actually helped me escape an abusive relationship that I was in, so. Oh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, my book is kind of three parts. You know, it's like the normal mom living a life, going on Shark Tank, building a furniture company, <laughs> doing, you know, going to Target, spending too much money, you know, normal stuff. Then it goes to the awakening spiritually and kind of understanding that this was real um, and all of the messages about my own childhood abuse. Um, at that point, you know, I just kept thinking I was 40. I was like, you know, I got this. I'll go to therapy. I'll just check the box. So I went to therapy and I thought, okay, well, I'm talking about it. I'm not really feeling anything, but okay. Like I'm thinking I'm doing all the right things. I didn't understand the subconscious and the way it works and how it locks everything. So at that point I started to kind of unravel and there was a lot going on in our marriage. I was um, pushing a lot of stuff down and um, Scott and I had been married for 18 years at that, at that time. I was always, I've always been very justice minded and um, very loyal, very, you know, and, and I thought, okay, um, I don't know what this is, but I can get through it. I'll get through it. I get hired by a large furniture company as a spokesperson, and they were going to acquire my furniture brand, basically. So they, um, it was Stanley Furniture at the time. So they were projecting like 5 million in sales. And I thought, oh my God, I really made this. And I'm still kind of keeping all the intuition stuff underground. I'm not talking about it publicly, but I'm doing it at that point. I show up at what's called Market, High Point Market, which is a big interior design show down in uh, North Carolina. And um, I meet this man. And I had this weird instant connection with him. You know, and it, and it was one of those things where I was like, God, why do I, I feel like I have known this man for lifetimes. Why does this feel this way? Well, when I, when I actually met him during that time period, that first day or two, I also found out that Stanley Furniture had just shut down their youth kids division. And they couldn't tell me until I got to market because they're, excuse me, they're a publicly traded company. So I'm, I'm there. I am completely turned around. Um, I'm in the lowest moment of my life. And um, I did something I will regret forever and ever and ever. But I just sort of fell into his arms in a way. Um, I didn't understand at the time that he was pretty much exactly like my uncle, um, which I didn't connect those dots. Um, but this man basically just kind of lifted me up when I didn't feel I was getting lifted up at all. And uh, I just fell right into the rabbit hole, like down the rabbit hole, I went. And if you've been in a narcissistic relationship, abusive relationship, you probably relate, like the love bombing is really intense. You've only known them for a week and you're like, I'm in love. <laughs> I'm throwing everything else away like an idiot. Uh, so that was kind of where I was operating. It was almost like I, I was little Kirsten. I, I um, didn't feel like myself anymore. So I ended up coming back and telling my husband, who I still loved, but I just, there was just so much between us, a lot of, a lot of stuff we went through in our marriage. And I said, um, I'm done. I'm just done. I can't do this anymore. And, you know, he was shocked out of his mind, but he also said later that he felt like he knew that this was related to me understanding that I was abused as a kid. So there was a knowing, an intuitive knowing for him. So I end up in this relationship for three years. My husband and I split up. Um, we uh, we split up. Our we had a great relationship though. I will have to sell you. Like we were just still really good friends throughout all of it. And I will give you a spoiler alert. <laughs> we have been back together since 2017, which is awesome. Um, and you know, again, I will always I, I take full responsibility for my actions. I will always regret what I did. But I also now understand that the three years of abuse that I spent with that man, it kept getting worse and worse and worse. Um, it actually gave me an opportunity to stand up for myself the way I couldn't as a child. Um, because, you know, I was abused by my uncle. I was raped by him between the ages of three and six, multiple times. And, uh, and so this gave me that 
moment to do that. Um, I wish it could have been a different way, <laughs> that's for sure, but it did. And the constant throughout uh, what happened during those three years with the, the children that I was helping were now helping me. They were the ones saying, get the restraining order now. Um, you can do this. He's not right for you. And I just kept thinking, okay, thank you, you know, <laughs> um, because I, it's so, it'll turn you around, you know, those kind of relationships. I hear all the time from people all over the world. The thing that will save you is also the thing that you ignore, which is your intuition. And so when I first met him, yes, I felt like I knew him. I did something completely out of character. Um, however, I also ignored the kick in the gut feelings. I ignored the small coercive control moments. Um, you know, I, I kept pushing everything aside. I kept, you know, it was a lot of cognitive dissonance, honestly. It was just me thinking like, well, that's not who I think he is. This, he just must be in a bad mood. So it's, it's it, hard. yeah, it's hard. Have you been it, through that? Not, I have not been through that, but I've been through different things. And at the time you think it's a great idea. And I think it's for anybody who's beating up themselves on something from the past, let it go because our younger selves really believed that that was the best thing to do. So let it go. And, but I, what I do know is that all of those things that happen it's through the tough stuff that we learn and it's through, yeah, the things that we go through that we're able to look back and realize. And for you, it's realizing how powerful your intuition mm -hmm. is. And you get to see like, oh, I should have listened to that. And now you use it for good. Yes. Helping these children and these other people come through. So it's, I think when we signed up for coming to life, you know, there was this agreement, it's going to be really hard. And we're like, bring it on. How hard could it be? <laughs> right. Yes. But it's really hard and really painful. So I just want to acknowledge you for everything that you've been through, taking responsibility. You know, there's something about responsibility, not that it's a make wrong or it's right or wrong, but when you, can you can sit in the driver's seat of your life, you have power over your life yeah. and it's, easier than trying to be a victim and making other people wrong you know were those men wrong and doing what they did yeah mm -hmm. absolutely mm -hmm. right but you're not going to get on with life if you spend your whole life making them wrong so uh, yeah and that's you move. know thank you for saying that that's exactly how i started to look at it you know once i started to put all the pieces together and i will say even my husband said um, we never divorced, by the way. That was what was so crazy. We never signed the paperwork. We never, you know, there was always just this piece. And he, um, you know, he was saying to me, please, you have, like, he was seeing me whittle down to nothing. I was smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. Um, I was, I would have died, whether he killed me or whether it was through my own doing um, in that relationship. And that's what Scott was saying to me. It, it doesn't have to be me. It just can't be him, please, for for you, for our kids. And, you know, that was super powerful um, moment for him as well, because, you know, not only was he he's such a beautiful human being, clearly, um, but he also recognized how much he needed to kind of grow up, which is what how he puts it during that three year period. And he talks a lot about, um, you know, he he would say that he was sort of in that Peter Pan stage where, you know, for most of our eight, first 18 years, he was running around having fun being the kid and I was fixing things. Um, layoffs would happen. I create a furniture company out of our garage, you know? <laughs> like I did, I'm a doer, I'm from Ohio. That's what we do in the Midwest, right? You just fix things. And so that's how I was wired. And um, our marriage is better than ever. I mean, I just adore, I think we are so grateful for each other. I adore him as a human being. He's highly intuitive as well. You know, he took accountability on his end. I have, you know, like I said, will forever, you know, be sorry that I went that route. I should have communicated more with him, you know, all of those things. But collectively, wow, like all of this, this, this fast paced healing that we went through, um, had that not happened, I don't know if we would be together. You know, it's really an interesting thing to think about. 
And I agree with the, the contract stuff because I, I finally looked at it like, well, I don't know if this is really true or not. Maybe I'll never know until I get to the other side, but what if these people were players in this play that I have constructed for this earth school that I'm in? Nice. And Tony played the bad guy, you know, and my uncle played the bad guy. And if that's what I came here to do uh, on a soul level to heal and grow, then that's what I came here to do. I don't completely buy into the contract business, but, and, and I always say this to everybody, take what fits for you in your life and if it empowers you, use it. But I think yeah. crappy things happen. I, do too. I think people have baggage and they take it out on other people. I think we do the best job we can, but out of everything that happens, we can choose to learn, we can choose to grow. Yeah. And then that becomes a gift where you can help other people that are going through it. Yes, absolutely. And I do feel the same way. I felt like, you know, I still had free will in all of this, right? Like I chose, that was my choice to make. Um, it was also my choice to stay in it longer than maybe was planned, quote unquote, if you believe in soul contracts, you know? So, so those types of things come to me quite a bit, you know, as I kind of reflect back, but I want to ask you, yeah. Uh -huh. how did you end up telling your husband about these little spirit kids <laughs> came to visit you? Well, oh, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yes. So when he, um, when, when that was starting to happen, you think that, you know, we've always been really close, even through our separation, we were really close, um, best friends, basically. And so through that, I knew that he knew me well enough to know that I wasn't, I wasn't losing my mind. You know, I, I trusted that. I do thank him for not, you know, putting me in some sort of institution during that time period. But what was also beautiful is that because he's intuitive in, in different ways, um, you know, he felt it intuitively himself. And there was one night I remember, and I, I talk about this in the book where I, we're laying in bed and it was early on and I see a child, a, a teenager actually standing in the corner of the room. And he, and I didn't say anything, but I had talked with her earlier in the day. And he said, do you see the girl in the corner of the room with the long dark hair? And I, yeah, he saw too. And he doesn't see often like that. But in that moment, I think he was meant to because I pretty much just, you know, hugged him to death. Like, oh, thank God you're seeing her. Because I still needed all this validation to know that I wasn't, you know, I wasn't crazy. Um, so from that point on, I know, you know, there was no doubt. He just really supported me. I think there were moments of hard stuff with he and I, you know, going, cause it, it changed my life. You know, I couldn't, I had to learn boundaries. I didn't know boundaries. I was feeling like I had to cater to everyone on the other side without understanding that I could actually set the rules myself. And because I didn't seek out this you know i had no interest in woo woo i was not going to some seminar i wasn't like there was no interest in it it just sort of hit me over the head um i felt as if they were dragging me like you have to do this and that takes a toll on your family too because i'm trying to juggle it all and i'm like okay i'll be with you in a second i'll get your message but i've got to make macaroni and cheese over here for my kids and then <laughs> you know i've got to spend some time with my husband so it was i wasn't good at that in the beginning and so once I learned boundaries and I learned to make the rules for myself and say that only those who are for my highest good are allowed in, um, it gave me space to be human and live this human life that I was meant to live. Yeah. And these kids, I'm assuming, all wanted to let people know that they're okay. Yeah. That was, that's what they wanted to use you for. Get to my mom, get to my dad. Yes. And that's, you know, and that's, that was what with the beautiful part of it that I've learned, you know, in talking with my own guides is I just basically put that out there whoever's for my highest good and their highest good is allowed you know is allowed in and all of those children of course were allowed in um what what wasn't happening anymore is that you know when we were living in burbank california at the time heavily populated area dense energy and i just remember looking out the backyard a lot because i i had come to the um understanding that i could help them cross into the light 
if they needed it. So I, I wasn't only seeing folks that were on the other side already, I was seeing folks who hadn't crossed. And, um, and I kind of felt like, okay, am I supposed to help them all cross? Like, what am I, what, what? you know, <laughs> how am I supposed to, how am I supposed to do all this? I don't know how to do all this. So that was what the beautiful part was to, to set those boundaries. And I just trusted that, you know, those folks will find who they're meant to be going to, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be me all the time. Do you know, does that make sense? It does. Okay. Yeah. How many kids do you think are people on the mm -hmm. other side? Do you think you've helped? Oh, wow. Um, Just, is it 10? Is it 200? I, 200, 200 yeah. range. Yeah. You know, and what's, what's beautiful about it now, because I do have those boundaries, um, is that I'm not overwhelmed when I'm trying to, you know, I'm giving a speech somewhere or I'm talking to an entrepreneur and helping them um, because I do have that whole work life as well. But whoever is meant to come through will come through. So if I'm if I am working with entrepreneurs in Arizona where we live, I'm at an event where there are a ton of people. If uh, you know if someone on the other side wants to come through, I will pass the message. And it's happened pretty much every single event that I've been to. And I don't make it known that I'm going to do that because I'm not there to talk about intuition. But it crosses into every aspect of my life in a very beautiful way now, not in an overwhelming or scary way. Thank goodness. So tell us about life now. Certainly you've got yeah. the book, you've been on interviews and all that, but you still carry on mm -hmm. a day job. Tell us about that. Yes. So, um, so I carry on a day job. So I still have Mod Mom Furniture, which is my company that What's it I called? was on Shark Tank. Mod Mom Furniture. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, I still have that, but actually I'm kind of moving into a different chapter with that as well. I actually work with Scott. We've been working together for five years now, and we are helping entrepreneurs across Arizona. Um, we run a nonprofit that has been around for more than 20 years, and it's called Moonshot, which is really cool. So, you know, it's been a beautiful journey to be able to work with him and spend time with him that way, too. And we just get each other because we've been through so much. You know, we always think, well, we're so lucky to be doing this. Um, and then, on the other side of that, we also I also have the nonprofit with Mark, and we're just kind of getting all of that off the ground right now. Um, we are working on a few cases, but mainly we're in the fundraising stage. Uh, and because I have this background in business and entrepreneurship, um, you know, a lot of what I do on that job is helping to stand the company up and make all which you know you're an entrepreneur right so make all of that happen which is also a full-time job um and then on occasion i'll get a text from mark and I'll, you know we talk almost daily and he'll say hey can you check out on this case for me are you picking up anything so it's a it's an interesting mix of most of my life is still business related and then i have this other piece as well um and that's it's great for right now i mean i honestly think it could you know i there's a TV project in the works and a possible book to film project that's also in the works right now. So, you know, I think life could definitely look different in a couple years. But for right now, I feel like I'm reaching the people that I'm meant to reach and helping in the ways that I can and spending time with our kids who are now all grown up. <laughs> hey. I know, I know. Wow, really great story. I appreciate all that you have to say and you take it as it comes. I mean, who knows what's going to happen to any of us in the, in the next two years, but keep having your feet on the ground. Don't do what you know to do. Keep being of service, integrity, got to have integrity, got to be true to your word. Mm -hmm. And then just trust that you are clearly being divinely guided. Yes, that is clear, you know, and I and I think that overall, you know, my main message in my book and the reason I wrote the book is I wanted to, first of all, like you talk about the fact that this is real, having not grown up in a world where I knew any of that, um, that the afterlife is real. We do live on. And then secondly, despite how tapped in I was to my intuition and working with cops and that type of thing. During that same time period, I still fell down the rabbit hole because of the wounding, you know, that I had endured as a child. And um, that's a big thing that is not, you know, from what I can tell is not talked about as much as it should be. 
And I think that, you know, understanding how the subconscious works and how it locks away all of that pain um, is a big deal because I hear from people all over the world who say, why do I keep attracting the same guy? Why do I keep doing this? And my first question is, do you remember anything in your childhood? Like, is there anything at all? So, you know, whether you remember it or not, it's still there. And that's a piece that I wanted, um, you know, people to understand as we all collectively try to heal this generational trauma that we have seen. Yeah, I'm sorry you got through it all and you're, it's certainly empowered you, but just to remind anybody who's listening or watching, not one of us is perfect. We're human. Mm-hmm. This is how we learn. This is what life's about. Bad things happen. There's awful people out there, but who do we choose to be? Yeah. And like Kirsten, you know, do a lot of self-reflection and learning and be responsible and grow. And yeah, there's a whole bunch of things I wish I could tell 19 year old Sandra, right? From 57 right. years old now. Yeah. But that's not life. But I do think in just what you're doing right now that being of service to other people is the top thing we can each do in whatever niche it is, whatever that is for you. It doesn't have to be big. You don't have to write a book, but just share. You never know who's walking around with a smile on their face or is posting all happy things on their social media, but inside they're really hurting. And so it's I don't want to say it's nice to hear a tough story, but in one sense, it kind of is because it lets us all know that you're human. Mm -hmm. You've been there, stuff happened, you're responsible for some. Right. There's another side to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And look at how good things are now. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. And I I mean, I agree. I think that, you know, a a friend of mine said to me, um, your book gives all of us a chance to be human and space to human and i'm really proud of that uh, because there's so much that goes on you know that we don't share on facebook and um and i'm seeing those private messages behind the scenes you know and um there's just so much pain in the world and i'm really proud that i was able to escape uh that relationship and to heal little kirsten from the wounding before and um, and to move forward. And I hope that gives folks hope that they can do that too, if they're in any kind of position that I've been in. Yeah, definitely. And I just think I've talked to now hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. Mm-hmm. And I hear so often from people who have had the near death experience that, you know, you get this life review, not like heaven or hell kind of a thing, but you just get to experience your life from other people's perspectives. So it starts off with maybe those people that you've wronged, but then it goes to the difference that you've made. So for all those kids on the other side, all those parents that got to breathe again, to see that ripple effect, Kirsten, of the difference your actions have made in their life, and that's why you're here. And so I'm sure there's going to be quite a long time that you're reviewing those files just to know <laughs> because we live and i'm sure you're like anybody else you know you live through your life you got your own negative thoughts it's just part yep. of being human mm-hmm. but meanwhile it, every little step we take in the right direction every person we help every smile we give every compliment that's sincere it all makes a difference and it, and it helps it does it absolutely does and i think that um you know authenticity is pretty awesome mm-hmm. and i think the more that we value ourselves and who we are truly authentically. I see that a lot, you know, and folks, I hear that a lot. Um, just being able to connect on a human level. And um, I'm just, yeah, I'm just really excited that I'm able to be here where I am now. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, after this crazy journey of mine. Do you have any final words for people listening or viewing right now? No. Anything I didn't ask you anything like, oh, I should have said this. Oh, man. No, thank thank you. You're so great. First of all, I felt like I just went on and on and on. Um, But I, (laughs) I think mainly, I just really want people to understand that, you know, this whole afterlife thing is real. And to trust your intuition, we all have it. Some of us are dialed up a little higher, some of us work on it to be dialed up higher, you know, but we all have it. And I think once I started to trust that, it was like having a compass for my life that I didn't have before. 
Let's talk just for a second about intuition. Your yeah. website is kirstenhathcock.com. Something popped up that you have a free intuition guide. I do. I yes. do. Yeah, I put a few I tips out there from yeah. what I've learned over the years. So thank you for sharing that. Sure. And what else do you have on your website? I didn't. So yeah. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. So I have um, I have some videos. I have some tips. I have some information on um, healing from abuse, from relationship abuse, from childhood abuse. So it's kind of a menagerie of different <laughs> different things, but um, hopefully everyone will take something away from it that is helpful in their life. And that's, that's mainly why I wanted to set up a website in the first place. Yeah, that's great. And you've, I know you've been on over 100 interviews, and you just keep going, you just don't know who's going to hear when yeah. and how and what nerve you're going to strike to let everybody know we do the best we can. Don't beat up on yourself. You know, be responsible, move forward and make a difference. Well, Kirsten, I'm so happy. Thank you so much for being our guest today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This was such a joy. Thank you. It was. And I love when you talk less work for me. No. <laughs> <laughs> and remember everyone listening or viewing, you can go to Kirsten's website at kirstenhathcock.com. And of course, there's a live link in the description of this episode. And for you who's listening or viewing at home, I know you can listen to this on your favorite podcast channel, but we're also on YouTube. So if you want to check out beautiful Kirsten, she is a beautiful lady. You can do that at, on our YouTube channel. And again, a reminder, go to we don't die.com. That's our home base, my home base. You get all past episodes. Like I said, you can get a free copy of my book. If you choose to enter your name and your email address, you'll get a little pop up there. And also please come to our free Sunday gathering. They are so freaking powerful and fun. And we've got music videos. There's an opening, closing prayer. There's a reading. There's a, a, an address. Uh, lots of fun music. And then, like I said, the last part is a medium demonstration. So there's people from all over the world. Literally, we get over 20 something countries represented. It is amazing. And their loved ones come through. And they come through with joy. They come through with positivity. They come through and it's so evident that they are with us in our lives. Certainly they're growing and learning and exploring and fulfilling their dreams on the other side, but they keep one foot in our world as well. And I promise you after over 26 years of investigating the afterlife and after over 570 hours of combined episodes, talking to doctors, scientists, mediums, everyday people, furniture makers, Yay. all kinds. I, I know it's real. It is real. And thank you for being here. So we don't die.com is the home base. So in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain. I really am so delighted and privileged that I get to be your host on We Don't Die Radio. I do believe that life is an education for the soul. It's hard sometimes, but we can grow. Your life here is so very important. Be authentic, be yourself, make a difference. Thank you for listening or for watching, and we'll see you again soon.